Alright, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. A warm welcome to all our participants. This is Mark Louis Luge, instructor at the Department of Art Studies in the College of Arts and Letters of UP Diliman. At ako po ang inyong magiging moderator para sa session na ito ng Teach Talk, How to Teach and Manage Your Gen Z Class. Ang Teach Talk ay bahagi ng UPD General Education Center's Linangan Program, which is the GE Faculty Development Extension Program. Ito po ay isang webinar series participated by general education faculty from various state and local universities and colleges and private, special, and other higher education institutions across the country. At present, may kita po natin that we are joined by more than 550 faculty members from various provinces here in Zoom. And aside from Zoom, the session is also being broadcasted in the YouTube channel and Facebook page of the UPD GE Center. The Linangan program aims to further enhance the teaching and learning of GE by creating these kinds of spaces for teachers' conversations that will facilitate exchanges about content, different teaching methods, classroom management, and learning resources under remote and blended learning modes. This session would be the last session for this calendar year, and it will center on critical approaches in the arts. For many of us po siguro, we would be more familiar with the course title Art Appreciation or Art App, no? as it is what is being used by the Commission on Higher Education. But later, our speakers will be speaking more about how we can possibly renew and revitalize our teaching of the arts by going beyond appreciating them. So before we start with the session, let us have some reminders first para masigurado natin ang organisadong um, session at pamamahagi ng mga certificates. Okay? Please type your questions or comments in the Q&A section in Zoom or in the Facebook or YouTube comment section. So we have uh, staff from the GE Center who will be consolidating them and we will be looking into them during the open forum. Please answer the evaluation form to receive your certificate of participation. The evaluation form link will be posted in the comment section before the webinar ends, specifically at the middle portion of the open forum. So abangan po natin ito sa comment section. For the fourth one, the evaluation form will be closed on the 20th of December, Monday, 12 noon. And we also ask for your patience as we send the certificates by batches until the 20th of December. And if you cannot locate your certificate even after the 20th of December, please check your spam folder first before emailing the GE Center. Okay, so to officially start our program, we would like to call in the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Vice Chancellor Maria Teresa T. Payongayong for her opening message. Visites. Thank you, Mr. Mark Louis Luge. Maganda umaga po sa lahat. Under its charter of 2008 or RA 9500, UP is mandated to perform its unique and distinctive leadership in higher education and development. This mandate includes, and I quote, leading in setting academic standards and initiating innovations in teaching research and faculty development in philosophy, the arts and humanities, the social sciences, engineering, natural sciences, mathematics and technology, and maintaining centers of excellence in these disciplines and professions. UP is further mandated to serve as a graduate university by providing advanced studies and specialization for scholars, scientists, writers, artists, and professionals, especially those who serve on the faculty of state and private colleges and universities. It also serves as a research university 
in various fields of expertise and specialization by conducting basic and applied research, promoting research and development, and contributing to the dissemination and application of knowledge. UP serves as a leader in public service by providing various forms of community, public and volunteer service, as well as scholarly and technical assistance to the government, the private sector, and civil society while maintaining its standards of excellence, end of quote. In fulfilling UP's mandate, it is important that UP shares its resources and skills with its colleagues from SUCs, LUCs, and private tertiary institutions. The Linangan Teach Talk series of the General Education Center under the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs is one of UP's innovative ways of sharing its expertise and disseminating research. The Linangan aims to train our faculty from all over the Philippines on how to teach general education courses so they can provide our students with broad perspective that hopefully would enable them to engage in local and global issues. We thank Professor Robin Daniel Rivera and Assistant Professor Sofia Guillermo for being with us today to serve as resource persons. Our topic, Critical Approaches in the Arts, is at the heart of the liberal education thrust of the general education program in UP, which aims to mold the student to becoming a holistic person, a more independent, creative, and critical thinker, a morally sound and intellectual individual of high integrity and well able to adapt to the fast changing pace of today's living. Ang lahat naman po ng ating ginagawa bilang mga guro ng bayan ay para sa ikabubuti ng ating mga mag-aaral at para sa pagpapaunlad ng sistema ng ating edukasyon. Let me also thank Director Nak Kimwell Gabriel and the staff of the General Education Center for organizing today's webinar. We thank all our fellow faculty members from across CUs and our colleagues, of course, from HEIs nationwide for participating in today's webinar. Maraming salamat po sa inyo at mag-ingat tayong lahat. Patuloy na mahalin at pangalagaan ng ating sarili. Maraming salamat po, VCTES, sa inyong mainit na pagsalubong sa ating participants. At this point, no, I would like to check again on our participants. We currently have more than 690 faculty members in Zoom at present uh, tuning in from different provinces and cities around the country. So I saw that the chat room is very busy at present, and we can see that there are a lot of faculty members coming from Metro Manila, from Luzon, such as in Ilocos Sur, Aurora, Batangas, Laguna, Camarines Norte and Sur, in Visayas, such as in Negros Occidental, Capiz, Iloilo, and in Mindanao, wherein they are coming from Zamboanga, Bukidnon, and Cagayan de Oro, among others. And also, no, we cannot um, we cannot miss out that there are also general education faculty members who are tuning in via YouTube and Facebook. For this morning, we have two speakers, as mentioned by VCTES, from the Department of Art Studies, Dr. Robin Daniel Rivera and Professor Sofia Guillermo. After their talks, we shall be having a five-minute break before we proceed with a one-hour open forum where we will be entertaining your questions. Then we shall move on to a synthesis, awarding of certificates for speakers, closing remarks, and a brief photo op. So just a reminder, uh, pwede po kayo mag-type ng inyong mga questions at any time during the session. And our assistant moderator, Chris, from the GE Center shall be consolidating them. Okay. Without further ado, ipakilala na natin ang ating unang speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Robin Daniel Z. Rivera. He is a professor at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Broadcast Communication from the, from the University of the Philippines in Diliman, a Master of Arts degree in Communications from the Ateneo de Manila University, and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Philippine Studies 
from the University of the Philippines in Diliman. His areas of practice and research are music, music production, sound studies, and popular culture. He is a performing musician, composer, sound designer, and record producer. He has produced recordings of the UP Cherubim at Serafim, Elena Mirano, Contra Gapi, Eraserheads, Dong Abay, Sugar Free, Periodico, and Bullet Dumas. He has exhibited sound installations at the Vargas Museum and Calia Wright Gallery in Manila and has served as sound engineer for the Bridging the Gap series of the UP Diliman Department of Art Studies YouTube channel. May we call in Dr. Robin Rivera. Sir, apologies, you are on mute, Pop. Yeah, now. Now, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good morning to everyone from all over the Philippines. This reminds me of my online classes because I ha also have students from all over the Philippines, from literally from Apari to Hulo. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I am going to start my presentation with my, if I'm allowed to share my screen, <clears throat> present, there you go. Let me wait until I can see if it's all okay. So today I'm going to talk about my course which I teach in the university. It's called um, Arts One, Critical Perspectives in the Arts. Okay, now uh, my talk will be divided into three parts. Uh, first, I will talk about content. Then I will talk about the activities that I do inside my class. And then I will talk about the platforms that I used, especially during this online this period of online uh, instruction. Okay, so I will start off first with content. Now, there are two things that I'd like to focus on here because uh, obviously I cannot do the entire course in uh, the time allotted. So I will just focus primarily on two things. First of all, in our course, we try to, uh, we, we, we use the con what we call the contextual approach. No, I like, to tell, I like to tell my students that art does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, art as a practice and as objects, uh, it exists inside social, economic, political, uh, and whatever sphere you have in society and in culture. You know? So when we look at the arts, we have to look, we, we, especially when we study the arts, because this is what the class is all about. When we study the arts, uh, we always have to look at it in context. Second thing I'd like, I like to tell my students is that we take a global perspective. Notice the global being a coin term between uh, global and local. You know? Now, in my version of the global perspective, we look at the world, you know, but through the perspective, through the eyes, through the lens of Filipinos. Okay? I mean, of course, you know, you have had move various movements here in the Philippines, like the Pantayong Panadao, looking, at, looking inward at ourselves. You know? And we have uh, many nationalist movements that say that we should study only our own. But on the other hand, there is also this global perspective in which um, we're not limiting ourselves just to our own culture. No? We allow ourselves to look at all cultures, regardless of where they are, no? but through the lens of a Filipino, through the experience of a Filipino. So these are two things that are very, very important okay, uh, in my class. You know? Now, 
This is a peek at the outline of my syllabus. No? I start out first with ideas, because basically all of these theories, all of these frameworks, no, all of these concepts are ideas. No? There's, there, there are several different uh, levels of ideas, no? but they are all ideas. No? And I try to introduce students to ideas that are either directly or even tangentially related to the arts. So I have critical thinking in the discipline of art studies, what is or who says it's art, frameworks, and then art and society. No? This uh, consumes a rather, a, a, a rather major part of the semester for me. Then I go into forms, so I differentiate between the visual arts and the sonic arts, and sometimes I, and I can talk about everything in between, because many art forms, for example, like cinema and video, occupy the space between the two. No? And then finally, um, I, the third part of my course uh, it, it involves curating art. No? And uh, I will give a little explanation of how this is done later. But today I will focus on three things, three components of my syllabus. Critical thinking and the discipline of art studies, frameworks, and curating art. So let's begin. Critical thinking and the discipline of art studies. No? Uh, critical thinking is one of those things that uh, people say all the time. No? This is a term that's very, it's what, we, what I call a catchphrase. People throw it out all the time. But uh, very often, and, uh, not, and uh, that includes here in my own university, uh, when you ask people to explain it, no? um, it's one of those things that they, they, they think they know instinctively, but they cannot really explain it. So because the, my, my course is anchored on uh, contextual approaches, no, I have to make it clear from the very start of the course what critical thinking really is and what is expected of the student if you're going to go and study the arts using uh, a critical approach. For, so for this, I use uh, an article by Armando Bonifacio, and take note of the uh, no, take note of the date. It's from the University College Journal Number no. One, first semester, 1961. <laughs> this is actually um, the University College Journal in the UP Diliman was actually the blueprint for the general education program as it was. Uh, as it was um, launched in, I think, 1959. No? I read back many books. No? There was no, apparently no general education course in, in college in the Philippines until they started, uh, no, until there was a law drafted uh, to have the Department of Education look into it. No. And the result was a general education program which was piloted and pioneered in the University of the Philippines and was later adopted to all the other uh, colleges and universities in the Philippines. So this publication, this University College Journal, basically was the blueprint for the general education program as it was first implemented in the University of the Philippines. And in this article, Armando Bonifacio lays down a very interesting um, definition of what critical thinking was. No? And I will read it, no, because this is, one of these, this is one of those things that uh, I think anyone teaching the general education, in the general education program, is one of the things, first things we should learn and the last things we should forget. Okay? And I quote, critical thinking therefore becomes essentially a constructive effort, and a person who has been trained to think in this manner is always dissatisfied with mere isolation or recording of facts. He always seeks to go beyond the bare data presented to him. He looks for the unity of things or ideas, and by extension, the unity of the world as such, for it is part of the assumption of science or of knowledge 
that the world is an integral world. There are certain invariant relationships which bring events or things together in one system. So this, this, is a, this, this to me was a very profound uh, and uh, complete way of looking at it. And this is the first thing that I have my students read because they have to know what they're getting into. And this applies not just to my course, but it applies to all courses in the general education program. Okay. The second reading that I usually give them comes from uh, papers in uh, the Second Philippine Art Studies Conference, which our own department held back in 2011. And uh, this is basically a history of the course that they're taking, the course that they are now enrolled in. You know? It starts in nine, the 1960s, when the general education program was implemented. You know? And uh, at that time, the course was called Humanities One, the Introduction to the Arts. And uh, this is the basic uh, art appreciation course, as was, as was uh, taken from the uh, University of Chicago course of the same name. And uh, most of you might know the, uh, the book by, uh, what's his name, uh, Pharisee. Okay. The basic uh, book called Art Appreciation. This is the course that I actually took in the, in the, er, the mid-1970s. No? It's a very, very, very formalist look at uh, the fine arts, actually. No? The fine arts uh, from Greek civilization. Uh, Western fine arts, should I, I should add. Greek civilization, architecture, uh, music. The basic seven arts no? from Western civilization. Okay, so this, is, this was the start okay, of the humanities courses, not only in UP, but also all over the Philippines. You know, basically, very, very, very formalist. But by the 1970s, which uh, if you were alive already, or you might have heard if you weren't, okay, this is a time of uh, very revolutionary changes not just in the political scene, but also in the intellectual and the uh, academic scene. Okay. And so by the very early 1980s, okay, our department had changed the thrust of the course from merely an art appreciation course to a more holistic view of art and it was called Art, Man, and Society. We were already looking into the interface of the arts, not really, it, it, still, yeah, the interface of arts with, stu with um, studies of society and studies of culture. Okay? So this is the dawn of an interdisciplinary uh, course, no? which looked not just at form, but uh, as I said, social, political, economic, uh, scientific also context in which art exists. Okay. By the 1990s, and I was already teaching then, actually in 1987, okay, uh, the course was renamed Art and Society for a number of reasons. No? One, um, it was more gender neutral. Because, siyempre, pag may man dyan, eh, nasa ng woman. So it's difficult to title something Art, Man, Woman, and what about everyone in between? No? So this would not have passed in 21st century, uh, no, in 21st century political correctness uh, test. No? So it was named Art and Society, simple, but very, very, very direct. No? And about this time, 
the movement towards uh, the uh, global perspective, okay, was already re was already uh, very uh, no was already very present, no, by the 1990s. No, all of us in the in the department were already looking at ways by which okay, how can we firm up this idea, okay, of a Filipino perspective to the world. Okay. Then by the 2000s, <coughs> there was a there was a name change because the uh, curriculum in UP Diliman and UP, the UP system had changed a little. So we had a name change, but we retained these same thrusts of art and society. Uh, now, the last, uh, no, the last uh, change in the course, which unfortunately is not here in this writing because it was in 2011, the most recent change <coughs> was in 2018 all throughout from starting from 20, the early to uh, 2010s about 2013 going uh, forward uh, UP was in the process of changing its curriculum its GE curriculum again so in addition now to using ju uh, the contextual uh, approach, we wanted to deal more with approaches because uh, at the, art, the, the Department of Art Studies, our, our idea was, okay, how are we going to approach this? This is a course in which we are trying to teach students how to study art. How do you study it? No? Appreciation, I keep on telling my students, you don't have to like this. <laughs> you don't have to like the, the, the artworks that I show you. You don't have to like it, but you have to understand it. No? You have to find the way, no? to find the way of understanding it so that you can study it. No? Because one of these days, no matter what profession you decide to enter, you're going to have to deal with art. No? If you are in the sciences, you will have to deal with the arts in one way or another. If you are in economics or business, you will have to deal with the arts. I keep on telling um, the record companies that I deal with, uh, yes, it's true, you're fine, you, you are business people, but you have to know that the, the product that you are selling and producing is art, so you have to understand art too. So all of these things, no? so I said, okay, this is a way we try to teach students to study art and to understand it. Liking it is another issue altogether. This is why I tell them, you don't have to like it, but you have to understand it, and you have to find a way, and we suggest ways by which students can approach the arts. And this is what critical approaches to, is to arts is to be. So these are the first two articles that I actually show them. So it sets the stage you know, for the study of the arts. Okay. The next uh, major uh, uh, revision that I did when I, when I was preparing uh, my course, uh, Critical Approaches to the Art, was that I noticed in the senior high school program, you know, and we, we had been tracking the senior high arts courses for a long time since it was announced, I noticed that uh, <coughs> there were some things that were already being taught to the students. You know? all the way down even up to art theory. That's why I have some students now, for example, in the past two years, <coughs> that already know their isms. Uh, the, and they can, they can write about it, too. They can drop it out of a hat and they can write about it. So we have to go, so I, I thought, I have to go farther 
No, I have to elevate the discussion no, beyond just definitions and theories. So now I can introduce to them the ideas of frameworks, okay, which I usually define, especially to my thesis students, as frameworks are systems. They're systems of ideas, of concepts, of theories, no, which help explain what you are studying. Okay? And, this is a fr and, uh, and I do this because I know that uh, come third and fourth year, when my students are ready, uh, when students are already uh, planning or writing their theses, okay, they usually don't know when they're a freshman. No? So I tell them, you're going to thank me for this because I'm trying to, uh, this is what you're going to get yourself into. No? In the study of things, in the academe, usually you start off with a framework. You have to construct a framework of your own. But the ideas are all there. No? And you have to read as much of these ideas as possible so that you can uh, select okay, ideas and concepts and theories which will help explain these things to you. And this is why I introduced to them the idea of a framework. Now, I have three readings here. I usually assign only the first two. The third is optional. I used to assign this uh, before uh, the pandemic. But these all contain frameworks. Like the first one, you might be familiar with. Uh, this is Alice Guillermo's reading the image in Image to Reading. And uh, the highlight of this is the four planes of analysis. You know? which is something that all of our art studies majors, again, this is the first thing that you learn, and this is the last thing you forget. Okay? So we're talking about the semiotic plane, the iconic plane, the contextual plane, and the axiological plane. I already introduced this to the students so that uh, uh, for their project, okay, and this is this handy for their project, and for whatever they write in the future, you know, this is the way our academic writing works. Okay? This is what, especially on the undergraduate level, you know, this is how uh, previous knowledge guides you. So this is pretty much an analytical uh, framework. The second reading that I give them comes from Elena Mirano, and this is uh, Tradition Musican Pantinig at Lumang Bawan. And uh, this is a classic methodological framework. No? This is actually an ethnomusicological frame, uh, uh, methodolog method methodolog methodological framework, which includes all the major parts okay, of a methodology. Pagmamasid at pakikipagsalimuha. This is observation and... Um, uh, participant, uh, observation and participant observation, panayam, which is the interview, pamamaraang laboratorio, which is transcription, which is uh, analysis, formal analysis, no, contextual analysis, historical no, analysis, and uh, pang -ab -ar artsibo, which is archiving, no? which again is a skill. Not really, a, I don't know if you'd call it a skill, but it's something that every academic should know. Uh, I have this, uh, <clears throat> one of my rants is that um, whenever people graduate from undergrad and they start working you know, all, all around, they forget how to do research. Okay? They forget their methodologies. No? So I like to, from the very start, I, I try to show my students, this is how an academic would do it. This is how a scholar would do it on the undergraduate level. So get used to it. Okay? This is research. Okay. Now, there's a third one, which is optional. As I said, I haven't used it for the past, during this online uh, teaching, but I used to use it. This is introduction. This is a con it's an interesting conceptual framework from Roland Tolentino, and it has to do with definitions of popular art and culture, in which he says there are uh, popular art and culture has several uh, characteristics. No? 
And some of that, you know, some of them is sounds um, rather blunt, but this is the this is the reality, you know, of popular art and culture. If you've ever uh, taken a course in art, popular art and culture, uh, popular culture ay ginagawa para sa kita. It's made for profit. No, it's also made with technology. No, so whatever your technology is, whether it is uh, the printing press, if you want to go back that far, whether it's the printing press or radio or television, or now you have social media, uh, popular culture, okay, uses the channels of, uh, created by technology. Popular culture ay nagagaling din sa centro. It means it comes from several uh, political or economic centers, like, for example, Manila, or Cebu, or Davao, no? or uh, London, or New York, or Los Angeles. <coughs> It comes from some kind of uh, geopolitical or geoeconomic center. It's also, oops, it's also transgressive. Oops. Wait, let me go back. It's also transgressive because anything can be popular culture. Anything. I remember a time in which um, this was back in the 1990s. Gregorian chant <laughs> became very popular, you know, in the popular music sphere in the West. I mean, like, you know, this is medieval, but then Gregorian chant got popular. Who, who would have, who could have ever predicted this, you no? Know? But it did. So in a sense, anything can become popular, you no? Know? And then the last characteristic uh, was uh, popular culture has a has a sense of sadomasochism, no? which is true. Consumerism, and I like to explain this to my students, what is consumerism? Consumerism creates a need for you to buy something that you don't actually need. <laughs> so we become, a, we become masochists. I have to buy this. I have to buy this, even if my computer is still working and still doing, I have to buy this new one because it can do so much more. This is consumerism for you. You have to replace something because it's new, because it's better, because it's improved. No? New improved Tide is better than Tide. Right? New improved Tide with blue speckles is better than new improved Tide. So on and so forth. Okay? This is a, so this, uh, again, is a framework. No? It's a system of ideas. No? And uh, I try to tell students, okay, beyond definitions, even beyond individual theories, okay, where do you go from there? You go to frameworks. And this is usually done, I think, in our third meeting in class. So I have them read these. Okay. Now, the next part of this... Oh, yes. And the other thing I like to... <coughs> I started... Actually, I started this just before the pandemic when I revised my art course. No? Um, people ask whether this is a course on creating art. No? We in the department said, well, you can create art if you want to, but, uh, we, have, but we are more focused on studying it. Okay? We are more focused on researching it. Okay? Now, one of, the, uh, no, one of the activities that falls under that is curation. Now, again, curation is one of those very, very popular terms. Everything now is curated. Okay? Your Spotify playlists are curated for you. Um, your menus are curated by your chef. No? Your movies are curated by film critics, by film festivals. No? Everyone is a curator. So I try to have students, no, especially during this pandemic, said, okay, you have artworks. 
Let's try and curate it. So I have three readings here. And uh, I used to have only two, but now I have three for this, for this school year. No? Uh, the first one is the appropriation of local culture in museum practices, which came from uh, an anthology, uh, anthology of essays, essays that our department put together and published. Um, this is the story you know, of the cura curation of a community museum. Now, usually our idea is something like, okay, when you have a museum, you have this almighty curator which selects you know, everything. But in this case, and, and this, is a, this is a growing trend since the 1990s, you know, if you're going to curate something for the community, the community has to participate in the creation of this museum. No? It cannot be separate. No? It cannot be an outsider coming in and saying, okay, this is what the arts that you should do. That this is the arts that we should uh, display. No. The community has to help determine what is important to them. No? And so this article has to do with working with communities, okay, so that the curation of uh, museums no, is negotiated between a curator, an appointed curator, and the community at large. Okay. Which I said, again, is, is, is becoming more and more and more popular as the decades go by. No? Second article has, uh, and this is especially important during the, uh, no, during the pandemic, curating domestic profusion. Okay? This is actually a little more anthropological, you know, but it had to do with the curation of items at the home. That's why you see pictures here of uh, tools, uh, collections of knickknacks, you know, collections of umbrellas, things like that. Because one of the popular, one, one of the things I told my students is that, you know, have you ever looked at, uh, at the objects in your home? No? Because usually, sa bahay, you know, we just put things and we don't really think about them or uh, if, whether they are works of art, no? Or whether they're just functional objects, no? But I, t I tell my students, take a good hard look at the objects in your house. They could be artworks too. And not just paintings. Look at your umbrellas. I mean, like, you know, your mother might have an umbrella collection. <laughs> you know, what goes into the design of an umbrella? Things like that. So this is an article on that. You know? And the last article is the collective storytelling and social creativity in the virtual museum, a case study. Now, this was a very early uh, article on online museums and it states several principles you know, that was learned in the project you know, of developing a virtual museum. You know. And uh, I remember um, one of the things that they discuss here is that why would you put up a virtual museum in the first place? Um, and the answer was, you put up a virtual museum because there are things that the virtual museum can do that a physical museum cannot. And that's what you have to look out for. That's what you try and implement when you're creating your museum. Okay. So these three, uh, no, these three uh, readings give very, uh, a, a nice variety of approaches to the idea of creation, uh, curation. Now, okay, now this is part two. What are the activities I actually do in class? Okay. I have five activities. Okay, first one is a video introduction. Now, it's a two minute video of uh, yourself in your environment. And I ask every student to make one. 
Now, some of them, it, it can be very, very, very simple. You just hold up your cell phone and take a video of yourself, no? Of yourself, tell something about yourself, where you are, and uh, where you will be studying, because I like to see what the environment of where they're going to be working is. This is very important to me. So I know what conditions they are under. That's why many times I'm able to think, na, okay, um, very luxurious in environment nitong batang to. Okay? Or um, very, very, very difficult. Okay? Ang conditions niya. No? And everything in between. So I have an idea of how they are going to study. No? And what they are up against when they study, when they read, when they are writing, and so on and so forth. Now, I have here an example of my own this was my video introduction, you know, just to give students an idea of what I wanted them to do. And I hope you can hear it. Hello, my name is Professor Robin Rivera, and I'm going to be your teacher this semester. Uh, I was born and bred in Quezon City, and right now I'm, my house is um, about eight kilometers uh, northeast of uh, UP Diliman campus, okay? It's uh, mid-February right now, and uh, if you might have noticed, I haven't had a haircut in a year. Um, a little about myself, uh, aside from being a teacher for how many decades already, I'm also a musician and a part-time uh, record producer and an audio professional. Okay. Um, you notice my environment here uh, is uh, I live in a quiet neighborhood, reasonably quiet neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> I have trees. I have one tree. This is my Santol tree, okay, which uh, in about a month is going to bear fruit already. Okay. My neighbors have uh, trees also. So let me show you where I'm going to be working this semester. Okay. I'm going to the house and show you my where I'm going to be spending <clears throat> most of the year. <laughs> okay. Let's go upstairs. My workstation is in the second floor, and uh, it's in the loft. There's no air conditioning, so you can probably hear domestic sounds and the rest, like the kitchen and the TVs and stuff like that, okay? Now, this is where I'll be working. Let's take it down, yeah. This is my workstation. It's got a second monitor, a laptop, and speakers, and all sorts of things. This is where I spend my entire day and uh, working, office stuff, studying, surfing, and it's where I'm going to be. Uh, streaming to you live okay so tell me it's your turn now tell me a little about yourself uh, where you live and uh, where you will be spending most of your time uh, working and studying in your house okay see you See you. Okay, that was my own uh, introduction. Okay, so uh, you should the students usually post all sorts of things. Some are very produced. Some are very, very, very simple. No, but uh, I'll take them all. No, just so I can see what other what kind of conditions they are under. The second type 
of activity is synchronous. Okay, synchronous meetings via via and I ako I I used to use um, Facebook streaming, Facebook live streaming. No, but now I'm using another platform, so <clears throat> I'll tell you about that later. So <clears throat> I usually give what's called a micro lecture. No, um, <clears throat> I learned this uh, technique. Uh, way last year, I was reading about it, and they said that okay, um, if you're going to, uh, no, if you're going to give a lecture, make it very, 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 very focused, no, because uh, it's difficult to introduce too many ideas uh, in one online session. And um, I agree because, like for example, you know, for all of us who have ever done meetings via Zoom, pag marami ng issue, <laughs> medyo <laughs> nakakabaliw na, no? So, I usually do a very, very, very focused micro-lecture, plus or minus 30 minutes, 30 minutes at most, no? And then, uh, then you add on announcements, class announcements and business and stuff like that. So, usually, I usually meet them once a week for about 40 minutes, no? This lasts from the start until about midterm, because those are my lecture periods. The second type of synchronous meeting I give, it's a, what's called a virtual tambayan. No? What I do is because, uh, well, I'm fortunate because I have unlimited uh, internet. No, I'm on an unlimited plan. What I do is I just turn it on. I just turn on my camera no, and turn on my audio. And I open up a, uh, no, a, Google, a Google Meet with my students. And they are free to just come in anytime they want. So it's like consultation. No? Usually about two or three students come in no, during that period. No? And then they will ask me questions so I can talk to them. <coughs> no? it's, 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 sometimes it's, uh, no, it's, uh, it's warmer than just emailing them. No, my advice. No, so there's a very so mas maganda yung rapport. So I, I again I hold this about once a week, no, from midterms onward because uh, in my in my syllabus they're usually working on their final project from midterms up. Okay, so when they if they run into any problems, uh, they can uh, no, they can consult with me and I can get it on kagad. But I make it a tambay and what I do is I play music, no all the time because I like to play music when I work, no? So when I'm in the tambayan, I'm also playing music out of my Spotify, you know, out of my Spotify playlist. No? Whatever, whatever comes, I will play. Now, the next activity is readings. Usually I have two materials a week, no? And uh, as I gave you kanina, those were some of the examples of the readings that I give. Two readings, two essays a week, and I give them enough time, I tell them, okay, I'm only going to meet you once a week anyway. So you have all the time <laughs> left in the week to read this stuff because there's no getting around reading. No? This is college. They have to read. No? I mean, I tell them, you wait until you get into the MA and PhD. <laughs> You're going to do even more reading. No? So two materials a week is okay. Before the pandemic, I even used to give them more. No? But uh, during the pandemic, it's, it's difficult to assign them a lot of heavy reading. So I limit it down to about two. Uh, sometimes I give videos also. I've made, a vid I've made videos available for them. Actually, I edited some videos on my own. So usually lasts about 30 minutes to an hour. So I said, okay, you watch these videos. You can watch it anytime you want. Okay. So there are two materials a week. And then there is the reflective essays. Now, what is this reflective essay? The reflective essay to me is 250 words maximum. No? Uh, they cannot go too much over. No? And I do this because it's every week. Every week, they have to give me a uh, reflection paper of no more than 250 words. Uh, 
Uh, this is kind of like uh, recitation, although you know it's it's kind of different. No, but this this is how I this is how I find out what the students are thinking. Uh, there, I know there are some people out there that uh, do journals, for example, no journal entries. Yeah, this is kind of like that. No, so you have 250 words maximum. Um, I give them more or less a topic every week. There's a different topic every week. And I think once, at least once, I will give them a free, uh, a free topic. And, but they can talk about anything they want. No? It can be in English or Filipino, but no Taglish. English and Filipino, these are the only two languages I understand. <laughs> so um, that's all that I allow. However, if you are from the South, for example, no, and uh, you want your students to write in, in Bisaya or Ilongo or Chabacano, or if you're from the North and you want them to speak Ilocano or Kapampang, Kapampangan or whatever, no, and if you, can, if you can write it, sure, fine. No? I usually tell my students, whatever language you are most comfortable with that I can understand. Uh, I've had students, for example, that write in English, and I notice it's this very, very florid, excessively florid uh, writing, and I'm going like, this is too much. Um, so, I, so I ask them, what are you more comfortable writing, English or Filipino? And they said, sir, I'm more comfortable speaking in Filipino. So, sabi ko, so why don't you write in it? No? And usually that turns a key when they write in Filipino. No? Because, well, this is my generalization. Filipino is a little more florid and direct than English. No? So when they write in Filipino, it turns out okay compared to their English writing. So usually I said, oh, this is much better. So okay, keep on writing in Filipino. That's fine. Great. As long as you can put, you know, if, you can, if, you, if they can communicate it effectively, then fine. Whatever language you're going to use, use it. But no hybrid languages. I said, if you're going to write in English, write in English. If you're going to write in Filipino, write in Filipino. All the way. Mm. So, okay. Now, uh, I tell them that there are three parts to a reflective essay. Okay? The first one is description. They have to describe what it is they do want to write about. Number two, there is analysis. And this is very, very important because you know, I'm, I'm try we're trying to teach them how to analyze information, you know, things that they learn. So analysis. And then there has to be outcomes or action. What are they going to do? Now that they have observed it, now that they have described it, they have analyzed it, what are they going to do about it? All these three things have to be in one reflection paper, 250 words maximum. Now, this is very tricky, and I warn them about it. I warn them, you know, 250 words maximum is very short. So you have to focus. You, know? you have to focus your thoughts. You cannot, you, you cannot make palaboy-laboy. No? It has to be a very, very, very focused thought so that you can include all of these three things in 250 words. Oh, by the way, the other thing I said, the, why I require 250 words only is that I had this rule to myself is that anything they can do, they should a be able to do with a cell phone. The cell phone is the minimum device okay that i anticipated from my students 250 words on the cell phone is not so difficult it's is not easy but it's not impossible because i have had students who only had a cell phone and did not have a laptop but they were able to they were able to submit via email you no know, on their cell phone so okay now, I even gave them a model. No, Sir Robin, excuse yes. me, will it be okay to, com uh, to finish the presentation in five minutes? Okay, I'll try All and right. do this quickly. Okay. Thank you, sir. So reflective essays, they have a model. This, yeah. Now, then they have an online exhibit, and I'll try to do this fast. 
they have an exhibit that has to be a combination of physical, ephemeral, and virtual artworks, 20 works, and a combination of on any one or combination of online platforms. But the exhibit has to have a term paper. And this is, it has to contain all the classic parts of a term paper. No? So, um, again, you have to show some, they have to show some kind of rigor, no? some kind of discipline. So the exhibit is the exhibit, but the term paper explains everything. And these are some examples of student projects. So I had this one on catharsis and crisis, uh, artworks, all sorts of things, you know. Ordinary Heroes, which was pictures of frontliners in her town. You know. I had this one about feminist music curation, curated a playlist of 20 songs that so all had to do with uh, 90s feminism. This one had to do with us, uh, artworks, uh, uh, public art in Cebu. And this one, the student actually made a website for an artist, a ceramic artist. Okay. Now, the last part is a little technical. <clears throat> it had to do with what platforms did I use? Okay. I had a choice between distributed and centralized platforms. Uh, now, I considered what were the primary issues of students online in 2020 to 2021. First was the digital divide, right? Very, in a, very unequal on internet access, bandwidth, reliability, and availability. Second, students were scattered worldwide, not just all over the Philippines, but even in other parts of the world. So I had a student in China <laughs> and, I had a, and I had colleagues who had students in the Middle East because they were stuck there and they could not come home. There were naturally isolated natural disasters. Like I remember in 2021, the three consecutive uh, typhoons that hit the Bicol area was devastating. I was expecting that in the first semester. Then there were people who were unfamiliar with uh, learning management systems there were lifestyle adjustments because, you know, now everyone was cooped up. And then there were health issues, particularly um, uh, mental health issues. So what I did was I opted for a distributed system. I used all the available platforms that I could get my hands on, which included I made my own progressive web app. I made a, f I made a flash drive version that I could send out to them or a cloud folder that they could retrieve. And I made a paper version because I had two students who did not have internet access at all. So I had to send out paper. To interact, I used email. I used the Google group. I used Facebook. I used cellular SMS and voice for emergencies, which came especially came handy during the, uh, no, during the Baguio in Bicol. Teleconferencing, Zoom, I only use it once <laughs> in 20 to 21. Now, how, did I, well, how was I able to do this? No. My timetable in last year worked like this. In March 17, the, cure, the quarantine started. From April to May, while all the universities were still deciding what to do no, with the semester, I started teaching myself advanced video editing and really advanced because I knew all the basics, but I had to learn advanced. So I spent two months teaching myself how to video edit on my computer. By June, grades were submitted. Okay. And at the same time, I was revising my syllabus for the coming semester already. At that point, I also had to learn web streaming because uh, I was going to stream to my students. I had to learn all the, I had to learn things like OBS, you know, and Facebook Live and stuff like that. And then in July, I started learning uh, progressive web app development and web services because I wanted to set up a website just for my course pack. In August, I tested and refined all my platforms. And in September, when classes began, I launched all my platforms. This was 2020. Now, 
in 2021, okay, there was an additional problem, cabin fever. Nainip na yung mga bata. Gusto na nilang lumabas. At, you know, there was a surge in March. And then there was the Delta that arrived. So, para bang urong sulong tayo. So, again, I had to dis- choose whether I wanted a distributed or a centralized platform. And I decided to put a hybrid. In addition to all the platforms that I was using, I now started using a learning management system, which is Google Classroom, which was the simplest, with the, which from what I know, was the simplest of all. I mean, like, it's very simple. Wala uh, masyadong gymnastics, pero it works, which is what I was looking for. I didn't need too much complexity. So at that time, at that point, my timetable changed a little bit. Great submission was in the second same in July. I did my syllabus revisions for the rest of July. <clears throat> I did my platforms revisions also in July. I learned Google Classroom the entire month of August, and I played with it, with my wife. <laughs> my wife was my student, and I was my student of my wife because my wife teaches also. So we learned Google Classroom together. And then I tested all my platforms in September so that by September 17, I launched all my platforms again. Okay. Now, so to recap, oh, matatapos na. Uh, we started off talking about the contextual approach and global perspective, which is to me a very, very important part of teaching um, uh, the course of critical approaches. Okay which makes it different from art appreciation. No, it's a completely different thing. Now, <clears throat> I also talked about my activities, and I also talked about my platforms. Okay? So this is how I teach my course in Arts One. Uh, <laughs> some of it is very difficult, and some of it is very, very, very complicated, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of a masochist when it comes to technology and teaching and that, so I like to kill myself. You know? But uh, apparently it's worked you know? S- with my <laughs> Gen Zers. Okay? So <clears throat> that's my lecture for today. I hope uh, you get something from this, and I will, I will wait for your questions later. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Maraming salamat po, Professor Robin Rivera, para sa napakamalamang pagbabahagi uh, ng inyong uh, pamamaraan ng pagtuturo ng Arts One. Okay. Um, makikita natin that the sharing is really generous you know, and it is a very organized mix of both conceptual and practical uh, points to consider whenever we are implementing or teaching uh, the general education course on the arts. No? I think um, one very important thing that I would want to uh, reiterate from the lecture of Dr. Rivera was yung pag-aaral po natin ng singing or art, no? it should go beyond yung mga conventional forms like painting, like sculpture, that are often seen only in museums. No? Lalo na for this particular period na um, we are in quarantine, no? at least before no? we were in quarantine, and it's difficult for the students to actually have a direct interaction with these conventional forms. No? By democratizing it, no? all the more na uh, mas ma encourage natin yung mga estudyante natin to directly encounter different things as they study them. Okay? Uh, and also, I would want to um, bring up no, that while Sir Robin was uh, sharing activities, no, I can see in the chat that there are certain faculty members who are also sharing their ideas that are related to what Sir Robin was mentioning. No? So we highly encourage that, no? so that this particular session can also be an exchange of ideas, aside from those ideas that you will hear from our speakers. Okay, so now let's move on uh, to our second speaker. If you have questions for Dr. Rivera, no, you can just uh, type in in the chat or in the comment section wherever you are tuned in. Okay, and then we will consolidate them and we'll talk about them in the open forum. Our second speaker is uh, Professor Sofia Guillermo. 
Assistant Professor Guillermo is currently the chair of the Department of Art Studies, where she has been teaching since 2007. She graduated MA Art Studies in Art History and BA Art Studies Interdisciplinary with a double major in Comparative Literature and European Languages, both in the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Okay. Uh, Professor Guillermo prepared a recording and it will be flashed in our screen right now. Arts one is not art appreciation. Arts one is more than art appreciation. To understand why, let's first review the objectives that underpin all general education courses within the UP system. GE aims to broaden intellectual and cultural horizons, hone critical and creative thinking, develop a passion for learning and scholarship, cultivate a high sense of intellectual and moral integrity, and foster a commitment to nationalism and social justice. Here are the course outcomes specific to Arts 1, Critical Perspectives in the Arts. Upon completion of the course, the student must be able to articulate aesthetic awareness using the language of art, discuss various critical perspectives in understanding art, examine art using various critical perspectives, and formulate a critical stance on the production, dissemination, and reception of art. The GE objectives and Arts 1 course outcomes inform the four main topics of Arts 1. Number 1, the art experience, creativity, and the human condition. 2, the language of art, three, the production of art, and four, art in society. While Arts 1 was formulated and proposed by the Department of Art Studies, to quote the University Council approved syllabus, the course outline is broad enough to accommodate and understand the different art forms, literary arts, media arts, performative arts, and visual arts in global and local contexts. As the course can be handled by different departments and colleges, the specific content for the course outline may vary across the UP units. The faculty will have a variety of choices in developing each module, activities, and reading materials." End of quote. The discussion that follows is based on my approach to teaching Arts 1. Needless to say, it is just one of many possible approaches. For Topic 1, the art experience, creativity, and the human condition, I find that it helps to go back to the basic human concerns and their material expression. A prime example is the Manungul jar from almost 3,000 years ago. From this secondary burial jar, we can see the level of technology and artistry that our ancestors were capable of. Just as importantly, we catch a glimpse of prehistoric beliefs in the afterlife. Despite the extreme hardship of a subsistence, hunting and gathering economy, 
the living cared for their dead. An afterlife can only be imagined, and the precariousness of life was no hindrance to imagination. The artists of the Manungul Jar shared their belief in crossing water to reach the afterlife, in common with the Vikings who buried their important dead in longboats. In Greek mythology, the body of water is called the River Styx, and the duly designated boatman is named Charon. Even if our ancient, even if our ancestors weren't too sure how babies came about, how to feed them was no mystery. One of the deities of Bagobo mythology, Mebuyan, the nourishing goddess, in this life and the next, continues to inspire artists who recuperate the past and adapt it to the needs of the present. Giving thanks for the Earth's bounty is ritualized in traditions such as the Pahiyas. From the roots in an agricultural economy, Festivals are now expressions of local pride that generate income from the national and international tourist trade. While the pahiya skipping was traditionally made from rice flour, it can now also be made of paper and even plastic. Between birth and death, is human striving for more than just survival. Before airplanes were invented, flight was only for the birds. In Greek mythology, the story of Icarus, the boy who fell from the sky, is a cautionary tale that artists have interpreted in various ways. In Bruegel's painting, described by W. H. Auden. Icarus's fall is no more than a blip in the consciousness of ordinary people as they go about their daily tasks. In this painting, it is easy to miss the flailing legs at the lower right of the canvas. In Matisse's version of the myth, on the other hand, there is an exuberance in the moment, with Icarus' heart glowing like a flame. This theme appears in another guise in Rizal's boyhood story, Ang Gamugamo at Ang Lampara. Art allows us to see the struggles and aspirations of humankind through fresh eyes. How we act after this experience is up to us. To borrow from the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire, we could say that art it does not change the world, but art changes people, and people change the world. At some point in the semester, towards the end, my students and I talk about memes, currently the most accessible visual form, thanks to social media. To the question, what image expresses your situation at the moment? One student submitted the meme at left. As a teacher and art studies major, I saw the meme's device of text placement, as similar to Barbara Kruger's work. This leads us to topic number two, the language of art. Some works, like Amor Solos, planting rice with Mayon Volcano in the distance, are almost instantly likable. 
This is in part due to the artist's masterful use of the language of art. Consciously or subconsciously, we perceive the pleasing arrangement of the elements of line, color, shape, as well as composition. This is art appreciation at its most unproblematic, and we can practice this in everyday life. For example, this is me with a supplied zoom background for this talk. Notice how the top of my head blocks the logos of the event sponsoring organizations. Art appreciation, as well as art criticism, suggests possibilities for improvement. This is one. However, there were still elements that I felt were unresolved. The Linangan logo shows a profile of a human head with leaves growing inside. Because this is not a natural occurrence, we can read this as a metaphor for learning. The image evokes organic growth. The background, on the other hand, is marble. It is a metaphor for the eternal and unchanging and evokes monuments and classical architecture. We have here a mix of two metaphors, one for the organic and growing and another for the inorganic and unchanging. As someone who likes plants, this is my edit. To return to more serious matters, in 1884, Juan Luna's Poliarium was awarded the gold medal at the Exposición Nacional de Bellas Artes in Madrid. Unlike the Amor Solo, this huge canvas is dark and claustrophobic and shows the dead or dying gladiator being dragged off to be despoiled of all his remaining worldly possessions. It is a historic painting set during the Roman Empire and was executed in the grand academic style. The gold medal from a Spanish jury was well deserved. But as many of us know, there is more to the spoliarium than meets the eye. A contemporary of Juan Luna, Graciano Lopez Jaina, described the painting thus. out its metaphorical content. In fact, when we look at a work of art and ask, what is it about? We are often actually asking, what is it a metaphor of? The indictment of the Philippine experience under Spanish colonial rule was hidden behind the classical theme and academic style. This strategy was often employed in various art forms during repressive times. One example in literature being Jose Lacaba's Prometheus Unbound, written under the nom de guerre Ruben Cuevas and published in the early years of martial law when mass media was under strict government control. With modern and contemporary art no longer confined to traditional materials, 
The language of art has also expanded. Duchamp's fountain, the urinal that shook the art world, can be appreciated formally in terms of lines and curves, as most of my students do at first. But formal critique can only go so far where concept takes center stage. More than a bathroom fixture, Fountain poses questions about art and the role of the artist. Another example, outside the context of the art world, Renz Lee's Agawan Buko, part of his nation-building installation, is just an ordinary coconut. In an unfamiliar setting, these changes in our ideas of what makes art art lead to topic three, the production of art. How is art made? What is it made of? What is the connection between a cathedral and Lechefland? You may answer this in comments. Patronage also plays an important role in the production of art, as even artists have to make a living. In most art history texts, the church is cited as an early patron, with most artists not even signing their masterpieces. Works such as Jose Luciano Dan's Langit Lupa Impierno also performed a didactic function, serving to constantly remind the congregation of the fate that awaits unbaptized infants. Later, more secular works appeared, commissioned by the wealthy to serve as status symbols. The reception of art is also subject to change. During his lifetime, it is said that Van Gogh only managed to sell one painting. Today, Van Gogh may be one of the most well-known artists of all time, even among those who have never heard of post-impressionism. The works haven't changed, but the world has. Closer to home, Jose Rizal's Noli Metangere and El Filibusterismo were banned by Spanish authorities. Now, the Noli and Fili are required reading for all secondary school students. In the traditional arts, production is rooted in cultures which flourished in ancestral domains. There is a dissonance between the value placed on the traditional arts in certain contexts. For example, the national costume portion of the Miss Universe contest and the militarization experienced by national minorities as their ancestral domains are taken over by foreign-controlled mining interests. Which leads us to Topic 4, Art in Society. We live in a highly visual world with images in art and everyday life, in URL and IRL, competing for our attention influencing us consciously and subconsciously. We already know that a work of art can have more than one life. Those of us who teach Philippine art are familiar with Itak sa Puso ni Mang Juan, painted by Antipas de Lotavo in 1978. Forty years later, in 2018, the work was referenced in a May 1 poster in support of the Coca-Cola workers' strike.
Some images can remind us of heroic struggles, while others can erode our sense of humanity. Whether in memes or painting or whatever artistic form, we recognize various aspects of the human condition. It is through being critical that we can imagine a just and humane future for Gen X, Y, Z's sake and the rest of the alphabet. Now for the bonus question, how to teach and manage your Gen Z class? According to a recent study, Gen Z supposedly has an attention span of 8 seconds. Another American marketing consultancy described Gen Z's thought process as If this were true, then we might as well be teaching goldfish with Alzheimer's. It may be that the internet and social media are partly responsible, but these are just tools. These tools convey information that may or may not be true, factual, correct, or even helpful. Critical thinking, like art making, is still very much a human ability and even more necessary now. That these are difficult times for the young might be an understatement. Students already have so much to cope with that I try to keep Arts One as relatable and core strengthening as possible. For the basic principle, this can't be repeated often enough. Art is a signifying practice grounded in society and history. Always historicize. To close, here are the class pictures of my two Arts One sections from mid-year term. There is hope. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Guillermo, for that creative presentation. So it kind of felt like as if we were part of her class, you know, we were consuming whatever she has prepared uh, for us this morning. Uh, what is also amazing was how she was able to um, connect um, different ideas uh, that she is discussing in her syllabus through looking at different examples coming from local and foreign contexts or even from the past up to the present. So I would just want to really reiterate no, yung challenge uh, that is imposed to us as GE faculty members. How do we um, ensure relatability and at the same time, uh, continue to strengthen the core of our students, considering that we are uh, GE teachers? No? 
So before we move to the open forum, no, we will be having a five-minute break no, for us to also uh, have time to consolidate uh, your very interesting questions that you have posed to us, not only during the session, but also in the pre-registration form. No? So it's time check. It's 10.40. So we will resume uh, our uh, session at exactly 10.45. Okay. Uh, feel free to remain in this Zoom session. Thank you and see you later. Simpleng ehersisyo sa palaupong pamumuhay o sedentary lifestyle. Sabi nga nila, sitting is the new smoking at ang pag-upo ng matagal ay nakakasama sa kalusugan. Sundin ang mga sumusunod. Ehersisyo sa leeg at balikat. show sa kamay sa likod at legs. Ugali ing gawin itong mga ehersisyo kada isang oras ng pagkakaupo. Ehersisyo sa leeg at balikat. Ehersisyo sa kamay. Ehersisyo sa likod at legs. Isang paalala mula sa OSHC.
Okay. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Um, kung titingnan po natin, no, currently we have 933 around 930 uh, participants currently here in Zoom, no? Makita po natin na patuloy-tuloy pong dumaragdag ang ating mga ang bilang ng mga participants natin ngayon, uh, which is indicative, no, ng interest nila sa ating pinag-uusapan ngayong umaga. So a few reminders lamang po while we before we start with the open forum you know, so you can still continue to post your uh, questions in the chat box here in Zoom or in the comment section in YouTube and Facebook pages of the GE Center and um, our assistant moderator Chris will be consolidating them baka may habol po natin sila for this open forum and then in addition um across several of the um, several of the questions from the pre-registration we saw that there are a lot of questions about the different attributes and behavior of the gen zers you know, which is a little uh, generic you know, not only um, specific to arts one you know? actually the ge center already had several sessions of teach talk and together with that uh, a webinar that is more specific to that purpose, which is entitled ABCs of Gen XYZ. So the GE Center staff will be posting the links to these particular webinars so that you can refer to them okay, uh, in relation to these questions. Uh, there, so the ABCs of Gen XYZ, Understanding Our Learners webinar with Professor Grace S. Ku. Okay, so this happened already, but the recording can still be accessed by uh, clicking on that link. Right, I think we can already start with our open forum. Together with us are our speakers, um, Dr. Robin Rivera and Professor Sofia Guillermo. So I am very sure that our participants, uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, our participants really enjoyed and were enriched by your uh, presentations. So let's have um, the first set of questions. No? So they're actually a pair of questions, which are questions that I think we often hear from uh, different people who are sometimes uh, not very well acquainted yet with the arts. No? So here are the two questions. Does one need to be an artist? or a creative in order to teach this subject? And the second question is, how can teachers who do not have any background in the arts teach the course effectively? Yeah, anyone can start. <laughs> can I? <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, sir, Robin. <laughs> well, for, though, uh, for the first question, uh, yes, you can teach okay, the arts, if you are not a practitioner, because there are also art researchers. There are those that research into the arts. No? Of course, being a practitioner gives you particular uh, perspectives. No? But there are those of us, for example, no? who are not practitioners, but they are uh, art researchers or art historians, you know? uh, it's, it's possible in that case, you know? Just as long as you study the arts. You know? Now, for the second question about those who have no background in the arts, uh, my suggestion is you better study <laughs> the arts. Uh, I remember when I began in the department, <coughs> because my degree was in broadcasting and uh, my perception of the department what it was mostly it was mostly focused on visual arts but i realized very soon you know, uh, that uh, number one uh, music is also art and broadcasting involves art too so Initially, I drew upon my uh, being a practicing broadcaster and a practicing musician. And then I studied visual arts. You know? I remember it was, um, 
it took a while, <clears throat> no, until I got into the swing of things. But I really seriously studied uh, what was going on in the visual arts, <clears throat> how to analyze it. So you have to put in the work, no. If you don't have a quote unquote a background in the arts, you just have to put in the work. It's that simple. Because if you don't, then what are you going to teach <laughs> if you have no background? No? So uh, what, if you're coming from another discipline, for example, no, you try to find the connections between your discipline and the arts. That's where you begin. And then you have to study. And then you have to put in the work. And then you have to, do it, you have to put in the research. Okay? That is the, that in, that's how you can teach the arts. Okay, thank you, Sir Robin. No? So I think that answer stresses the idea of the interdisciplinarity and multimodality of art. Mm -hmm. no? It's not only limited, of course, to the visual arts. No? We can look into first, no, coming from you as the faculty member, you know, uh, where are you coming from? And probably you can look into how you can relate artistic concepts with whatever you have done previously, et cetera. And that can be your starting off point. While you expand your knowledge on the topic, of course, given that you are a faculty member. Um, so, Ki? Um, good morning. Um, to the question, um, can we um, teach art without being an artist or a creative? I really think that we are all artists and creatives. <laughs> whether we're teaching, whether we're teachers or students, whatever we are, we are all artists and creatives. Um, one thing that we tend to forget no, when we get too much into theory is that art is perceived through the senses. Uh, we look at things, we hear things, we smell things, we feel things, um, and we all have senses. Um, so that suggests that we all have the capacity huh, to be artistic and creative. Um, probably the only difference between me as a teacher no, um, is that um, we are trained no, to be more aware. No, we have a heightened awareness. No, so um, we're not happy with just seeing. No, we also have to look. We're not happy with just hearing. We have to listen. No? Um, so we have to know why, you know, why we feel that way about things. And that's a lot of where art appreciation comes in. We know why. We can say why we like or don't like something. And I think everybody does that, whether they're they think they're artists or creatives or teachers or students. Okay. So okay. it's there. It's in us already. All right. Thank you, Mom so Sophie. No? So parang, uh, the answer of Mom Sophie really democratizes this notion of artistic or aesthetic experience. No? That every one of us has actually that capacity to see and hear. No? It's only uh, sa atin na lamang yun if we would want to extend it further no? to make it um, more critical in terms of how do we look at them and how do we listen to them specifically. Okay, so I think the answer, the question was answered well by our speakers. So let's move on to the next question. Um, how do you decide on which set of artworks should be included in the course? Okay, so this is uh, a tricky question. No? Anyone uh, can start? Well, that's curation. <laughs> you, you cannot present everything you know, in one course, so you have to curate. Uh, it's just like how you curate readings, no? What readings do you think, uh, what readings or materials or videos do you think um, will help uh, enlighten students about uh, the themes that you are presenting, no? So, for example, I did a video of, I did a video of, I, I remember early on because I had, when, when we were doing the transition from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to online, that was in the 2020, no? I think that was the second SEM. <clears throat> uh, a lot of my lectures in uh, music 
no? uh, were PowerPoint presentations. So what I had to do is that, okay, I have to make videos instead of presenting it to be face to face no? and, and playing a lot of videos and performances. I had to put it all on vid I had to put it all and edit it all in the video. So what happened was I had to select a completely new set of videos that I and I had to download from YouTube several 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 videos just to drive home my point, no? And uh, basically I just chose from it, it, it was a personal choice, no? But uh my point was okay, uh because in the, my, my music module the approach is um, we have to look at music no matter where it comes from. All this idea of the music as a universal language uh, has a slight problem in it, no? Because the point is that music is a universe is present in pretty much almost all cultures, no? Music or something like it is something present in all cultures, no? But uh, you cannot put it within the framework of just Western music because there are other musics that, uh, that, that appeal to different senses, that appeal to different sensibilities, that have different elements. So what I had to do is that I had to select music from all over, from a variety of cultures. So I got Western music, I got Western popular music, Western classical music, I got uh, Japanese music, I had Indonesian, I had Filipino, I had African music, I have got everything, no? But I had to curate it, no? S uh, because uh, that was the point that I was trying to drive at. Music or something like it, no? But each music is, is, has a different language, no? So I'm trying to present all these different languages, no, to students. So it's all a curation thing. No, you cur we curate our readings, we curate our examples. No, but what's the point? No, what is the point that we are trying to drive at here? No, again, it has to have a framework. It has to fit that framework. Hey, thank you, Sir Robin. No, so parang there should be a point or a message to be communicated across, which follows the framework of teaching for that particular course and then that would should inform you know, the way we select what particular objects or experiences that we'll look into. Thank you. Um, I think Ma'am Sophie's presentation a while ago involves a lot of selection, you know, considering that uh, it looks into different uh, artistic objects and experiences. Uh, maybe you can share also, Ma'am, your answer to the question. Um, I absolutely agree with Sir Robin's um, um, statement earlier that um, people talk about music as being a universal language, but um, that does not really go into the, com uh, the complexities of it. I mean, we cannot judge um, East Asian music by the standards of European Baroque. <laughs> we can't do that. It's not absolutely not going to work. And if you ask me to teach music, I would probably talk about the lyrics. Um, about the teaching materials that are open to us, um, I welcome a lot of material from my students. I learn from them. I ask them what they are watching or looking at, what they're interested in right now. And a lot of it, I have no idea. You know, so I have to look things up so that I know what they're watching and so that we can talk about them. Um, I think it's also been said earlier that you don't have to like things. Uh, we even welcome things that we can problematize. No, we welcome those no? um, because these bring um, ideas, no positions, perspectives out in the open. Nobody wants to talk to and uh, speak only to the converted. Yeah, we sharpen ourselves by talking about all sorts of things. So I think um, everything's um, to be learned from. Thank you, Sophie. I think that particular answer is very much responsive to the next question. The next question is saying, how can we encourage young learners to become more interested in the arts? So how do we probably connect with them better so that we can 
um, um, spur that interest within them. Anyone? Probably Sir Robin. I think yeah. Mom Sophie's I'm answering another difficult. question here. What's the <laughs> Um, how can we encourage young learners to become more interested in the arts? Okay, here's a. Uh, this is related to a question that I'm answering right now, ano? Because uh, there's a question here from Yami Fernandez, uh, and I will read it, huh? Because it's public anyway. I'm an instructor at the state university. Most of our students are from the mountains and less privileged. Of course, art is something that they disregard in their day-to-day -day living because they are actually busy working just to make ends meet. How can we convince them that art has relevance in their lives? You cannot just teach them about art just for the sake of teaching art. Now, this is the problem. Um, art is not just the high arts. Art is not just Western art. No? Art is also the songs of your, the songs of your culture. Art is also the music of your culture. Art is also the, the, the images in the textiles of your culture. These are the traditional arts. I mean, like, you know, come we study, there are three types of arts, the three, three categories. There's the high arts, which is mostly Western. There is the, the uh, traditional arts, you know, as like what I mentioned, uh, 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 quote unquote folk songs, folk dances, uh, textiles, you know, design, architecture, uh, traditional architecture, all of these things. And then there's the popular arts. No? Now, um, we, 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 that means no, if you look at this, uh, this diversity of art, then art is part of your daily life, no? The so I mean, I worked in UP Baguio for three years, no? I taught there for three years. And I, what I remember is that there were a group of students every Friday afternoon. Apparently, they were from the Cordillera. I don't know which group they were from, no? But uh, every Friday afternoon, about five o'clock, uh, when classes were dismissed already, they dala nila yung mga gangs nila, and then they would start dancing and singing and it was a wonderful thing now d this is art this is what they do because apparently this is what they do in their homes this is part of their life this is part of their culture um when we talk about culture again the problem is that many times we're talking about high culture again which is a very western thing no but culture is your way of life in, in, if you if you're following the anthropological definition of culture culture is your way of life and artistic expression uh, whether it is individual or collective with or a group no is art no so sakin th this this is the you we 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 cannot separate art no from our daily life that's what makes it important. That's why we have to study it. Because you know, it happens and uh, we, we, we say we're not conscious about it. But we do it. Eh? We practice it. No? And so now is the time to study it. Now is your student's chance to study the very things that they do that they, nev that they, that they never thought of art. And yung pala it is art. So pwede natin pag-aralan yan. That's why our department is called the Department of Art Studies. We study it, no? We formulate theories about it. We formulate concepts about it, no? If all we were doing was appreciation, then we already appreciate it, no? So, that's why we study it. We should study it, no? And that's why our department is the way it is. Okay, thank you, Sir Robin. I think um, it was able to pose um, a very important point that perhaps in our classrooms we can initially uh, bring up already you know, that the mystification of that idea of art that is limited only to uh, probably Western quote unquote elitist notions of 
uh, art being probably uh, being limited only in conventional forms in particular spaces. No? Uh, I think if I can share, you know, if I may share, even I myself experienced that. No, I think uh, I was from the province. Uh, actually, I'm still in the province right now. You know? <laughs> so uh, my exposure with the arts, um, uh, I didn't really uh, realize early on in my, uh, in my life. You know? uh, I would even think that uh, I think the per um, that idea of art being painting, sculpture, it's a very pervasive idea um, across uh, the country. And um, I think it is important for us to bring, uh, to pin down or bring up or expose these particular uh, students at uh, even at the early earlier periods of their life, no? that certain experiences and objects that we actually encounter in the everyday. So just for example, me, uh, I live in a near a church you know, with uh, very beautiful frescoes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when I was young, I never saw them as artworks. You no, know? so that is a very uh, uh, that is a very sad thing to admit. You no, know? considering right now that I am also part of uh, those teaching um, this more democratized idea of art. You know? So we have to expose them at the onset. You no, know, that these particular objects, experiences, practices that are surrounding us, that are also pervasive around us wherever we are here in the Philippines, they can actually be um, considered as art and deemed worthy of being studied. Okay? Yes, and, I, and I'd, li I'd like to add, no, this is one thing that uh, I think is happening in the senior high program. No? Ever since the senior high program started, I know, for example, there is a course on uh, art in the regions, right? I was reading the, I was reading the curriculum, the arts curriculum in senior high, and I and I've heard of it, and my students have talked about it. Uh, you know, a lot of what they learn about the arts, uh, it's it's from their class in arts in the regions. I think this is a very good thing. This actually uh, uh, helps jumpstart this idea that no matter where you are in the Philippines, whether you are in the centers, no, of where it, whether you are in the centers of high art or popular art or whatever, or whether you are in the fringes, no? like in the province, small towns and all of this and all of that, um, there is something in your region no? that is art. No? Whether you know, it is the frescoes in your church, you know, or whether it is, uh, as, uh, as I was talking about, the, the, the music, no? of the cordilleras, no? the textiles of the cordilleras, no? the music of, the, of, south, of, of uh, southern Mindanao. No? Uh, the, the, that, that course has already given us uh, a jump start. So now we, we tayo in college, we, really, um, we just have to brush up at the start this idea. No? that, okay, you have arts in your place, no? These are probably either traditional arts, and you have your popular arts too. And you've probably seen some fine arts, maybe in picture books or something, no? But all those are art, no? So as far as, as, far as the uh, traditional arts is concerned, no? That course is very important, and I'm very glad that they instituted it. Because the results no, that I'm seeing among my students is very positive. No? So we have to thank the DEP, we kind of have to thank the DEP Ed for that. Thank you, Sir Robin. No? If I uh, may um, promote as well, no, one of the textbooks that can be uh, chosen for CPAR, no, that's the name of the course, was actually penned or authored by members of the faculty of our department yes, uh, in yes, the art yes. studies. No? To, to promote lang po. <laughs> okay, uh, there is a, a very a beautiful comment from our co-faculty in the chat box from uh, uh, Dr. Hernandez, Eloy Hernandez. Um, this is uh, what the message says. Our students are very interested in the arts. They just don't realize they are consuming the arts. Hip hop, Spotify, memes, video games, K-pop, drama, etc. 
they consume those every day. What we have to do as Arts One teachers or Arts App teachers for uh, the SUCs no, is to deepen their understanding about these art forms, encourage them to be more critical. Okay, So beyond the Uma traditional forms that mentioned by uh, Sir Robin and uh, the high arts, now we can also tap into the potential of looking into popular arts and culture as well. Okay. Anything to add, Papuba, from our speakers? Hi. Yes, Mom um, Sophie. Um, regarding activities, um, back in face to face, I don't give pop quizzes really, but I used to have this pop show and tell, where without any preparation, it would ask my students to show and tell anything they have on them that is art. <laughs> So it could be anything. It could be their shirt. It could be their keychain. And it could be a picture in a book. No? And one of them even showed his lunch, no? which was pinak bed. And so we appreciated it formally um, and aesthetically. No? So it's art is everywhere. We just you know, um, have to... Um, um, show and you know, teach you know, our students that they're just there. They just have to find them. Okay, thank yes, you, Mom. As, so uh, as a teacher also of art, you know, again, we have to be aware of all the categories. Again, the three main categories, which is traditional, popular, and high. We have to be aware of them. You no, know? Like, for example, hey, I'm, how old am I? I'm, I'm 63. No, but uh, I am very conscious when I watch popular, when I watch and listen to popular art. So I listen to a lot of popular music, whether I like it or not. No, um, I listen to it. No, I, I tell myself, okay, I'm going to listen to it. I'm trying to figure out why my students would like this. No, whether I like it or not. No, I try to watch. No videos, music videos. No, so I'll watch BTS and their spin-off cartoons, BT Twenty One. I watch this stuff, whether I like it or not. Although I like BT Twenty One, <laughs> I'll watch it because I have to know what they're what what they are uh, what uh, not consuming. Uh, I want to know what they uh, view, no, what they are an audience of, and I have to understand it also. No, at the same time, I also have to know a lit, uh, what traditional arts, uh, particular students out in the regions, may have, so I can tell them, hey, you know, do you, you're from Cagayan de Oro, do you know that you have a thriving underground rock scene in Cagayan de Oro? <laughs> and some of them are going. We do, sir. I said, go. Yes, you do. It's very underground, but you, if you don't know it, but I know about it because I heard about it and I've seen some of it. No, so we have to be very aware. We have to consume it also. No, uh, whether we like it or not. <laughs> Again, we have to put ourselves in the position of our students. No, we have to study it. We have to study all sorts of arts. No just like we are asking our students to study it diba we are asking them to do this eh? no we are we are we're telling them to do this so we have to do it also hey thank you sir robin so to connect no, the the activity that was shared a while ago by Mom Sophie, with what was shared by Dr. Rivera, no? we can see how it's very important to locate you know, where our students are coming from. You know? And one way for us to uh, learn more about them is to ask them about what these particular experiences are, uh, where they are embedded in. You know? uh, and then in addition, you know, as mentioned by Dr. Rivera, it's important for us to learn more about where they are from. You know, most especially now you know, that we are in a pandemic situation, so most of our students are in quarantine, so they are limited within the perimeter you know, kung nasaan sila at present. You know? So all the more that we have to learn more about where they are. Kasi nga, 
Uh, tulad nga nung binanggit na sa pinakaunang slide ni Sir Robin, no, uh, teaching the arts, at least in the art studies way, it is heavily contextual. So we need to know where the environment uh, of that particular person is. Okay, so that we can easily or better um, make the experience relevant to the students. Okay, so thank you for your input. Let's move on to um, something more practical. Naman. Okay, this question is in relation to the artworks that we selected previously. No? How do we deal with the challenge of providing art samples that are mediated when shared in the classroom? For example, you can only show a digital photograph of a painting instead of the painting itself. You know? So, ibig sabihin, hindi direct yung experience to the actual object, you know, but just a reproduction of that object. Taking into account that the medium is the message. Okay, do you have thoughts on this question? <laughs> Actually, we've been doing that forever. Uh, yes. Because uh, <laughs> most of the, for example, most of the uh, high art examples uh, we've only seen in books like for example i remember um some years ago uh we visited you know we were able to visit china uh, because my wife was speaking at a conference and we and we managed to be to go to the shanghai museum <clears throat> and for the first time we actually saw the stuff that we had only seen in books <laughs> <laughs> so we were going like, oh, no wonder, no? So we've been doing this for a long time. It's just that now we're online, but before we used to do it in books. Um, th that's really problematic. Because you know? even tayo as teachers, eh, sometimes we've never seen the real thing. No? I mean, like, I've never seen the Mona Lisa. No? But I've seen this Polarium. No? So, it's up to us to mediate in that case. It depends on how well you, the teacher, can mediate what it is that makes a particular artwork work. No? What it is that they should be looking at. No? Uh, what the historical context of this is all is. No? This is for works that exist, exist, for example, in the physical realm, of which what we are seeing is only representations. No? But for other things, for example, like videos, no? uh, let's say music videos. And music videos were made to be watched on a television or on a smartphone no? or on a tablet or a, or a laptop. So there's no problem there. No? Movies were made to be watched on the big screen. No? So again, uh, it's our job to mediate no? and to direct the student what to look, what to look for, no? what to investigate. No? In the absence of the actual work, what should they investigate about in order to understand it? No? That's our job. <clears throat> Thank you, Sir Robin. How about you, Po, Ma'am Sophie? Um, I was actually lucky enough no, to see the Mona Lisa live and in person. Um, but like most of us, I first saw her in books and then I saw her live and then I saw her online. No? You know, online, you can actually zoom in, in, zoom in, and zoom in, and zoom in, and zoom in until they're actually up her nose, no? and you can see all the cracks and everything. Now, those are three different ways of, um, I won't use consuming. <laughs> These are three different ways no, of experiencing the work. Um, but they are all, you know, these experiences have their own validity. But we cannot say that seeing the Mona Lisa live is going to be better than seeing her in books. I mean, lots of people go to see the Mona Lisa just because they have the money and they want to have their picture taken with her. Now, that doesn't mean that they actually appreciate her more. So these are different experiences of the same work. Um, and they're all valid and they're all worthy of study. And the reality is that most of us won't get to see the Mona Lisa 
actual Mona Lisa, no? Um, but we can have an appreciation that has nothing to do with airplane fare. <laughs> huh? Okay, so, man. Um, also, um, seeing works live, no, as opposed to seeing them mediated, no, through other media. Um, that brings in the idea of aura, eh, di ba? Yes. Aura na, na <laughs> Um, but. Um, that's also problematized na rin, no? the idea of horror, um, especially now since a lot of work are online and um, and are uh, no, are use uh, and use other media. No? So um, in short, no, there are many ways of um, experiencing art, and they're all equally valid no? and worthy of study. No, let's not diss the ones who can't go out. And I think this generation is, uh, no, because of that, I think this generation should be, uh, is privileged to be able to experience different artworks in so many different ways. Because before, you know, I mean, before books, how could you experience a painting? You had to go. And then we had books, you know, and then we had movies, and then we had television, and now we have the internet, you know. So, parang they, they they are very very fortunate, no, to have all of these uh, the, these channels at their disposal at their disposal. But at the same time, each experience is different. Correct, tama sa nabi mo, Sophie. Each experience is different, no. Thank you. Uh, so, para pong, I think I would just reiterate no yung idea that all of these modes of um, encountering uh, artworks, um, whether they be objects and experiences, experiences has their own. Um, probably we can consider it as gains and losses, no? So iba iba naman sila ng tipo ng modes. So um, actually, that is also something that is interesting to look into in our classrooms. Okay, so now let's move on to a more a more more practical question, no? So. How can we ensure, ensure that the goals of the topics to be discussed are being met? What might be the best assessment tools or activities for this particular subject? Hmm. How do we assess? Sa akin, ang assessment ko is ano nga. That's why I, I put a lot of uh, weight on their reflections. No? Again, this is not something that you can do in a true or false exam, no? which is why I don't give uh, timed exams. No? This is not the kind of course that relies on timed exam. No? Um, this is why very consistent dapat yung uh, feedback nila via my reflection papers. So not only do I uh, observe for consistency no, in their work, but I also try to observe uh, how, how they change in the course of the semester. No? Are there ideas that they latch on to? No? And I give them credit for that. Are there questions which um, may seem uh, generated? by this having learned certain things. Because there's questions that are based out of, you know, just not knowing, no? But there's certain knowledge that when it comes, it generates another question, eh? no? So I also value that, no? Do they, do they, is it generating some kind of, um, inqu uh, some kind of, is it, does it generate their inquisivity, no? Are they getting curious about things that they don't know? You know? This is how this is how I, I know I, I take this into consideration when I give them grades for the reflection papers. You know? Some are very, very consistent from beginning to end. This is the way they write. You know? Some they grow. You know? Some degenerate because 
you know, during the end of, towards the end of the semester, medyo they're already very hassled. So parang they go through their reflection papers na parang nagmamadali, no? I usually make, I usually call them out on that. So I go, oh, well, you, don't, don't, don't rush this, no? Parang it, it's obvious that you crammed this paper, no? <laughs> So, tipo bang, uh, start writing it a little earlier and think about it. I know you're all stressed, but, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So, when it comes to, you know, uh, assessing them, no? That's why the, the, the reflection papers, as short as they are, pero eh, very uh, defined yung what I'm looking for, eh, no? Defined yung topic and defined what they have to write, no? So that's how I assess them. Okay. Thank you, Sir Robin. No? I think it's very essay-based talaga kasi they're reflection papers. Yeah. No? And then through the way they write, what they write about, okay, okay. you get to track you know, the development of these students. So in a way, uh, that's the challenge of uh, um, teaching arts or humanities classes. No? So it's a very... Um, dapat to talk katalaga na sa mga estudyante, most especially if you are the type of professor or teacher who really cares for the development of um, these students, regardless if um, related ba sa arts yung degree nila or not. Yeah, and although uh, I just have to, uh, no, I just have to tell you that uh, it's a lot of work reading this. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I, I saw a comment earlier uh, in the chat box. I have 10 sections of 35 students each. How am I going to do this? Um, it's a lot of work. No? Ako, for example, uh, going through the weeks, uh, no, I can, let's say, for example, uh, in one section, I have about 25 students. No? Uh, it'll take me about a day to grade all of that. No? Kasi talaga, binababasahin ko talaga. And, you know, I, I, I read about it and I think about it and I try and you know, ponder on it you know, a lot, no? So it really takes time. It's a lot of work. And, I, and I'm usually at my computer from about, what, 9 in the morning to about um, 6 in the evening, you know? I just take a break for lunch, you know? And uh, it's a lot of work, you know? So I, I actually, I, I, that's why I'm, I feel for those that have to teach a lot of students, you know? It really is a lot of work, but then, what can we do? No? This is the type of course that we're teaching. So, this is, this is my method. No? And, of course, since I'm home anyway. <laughs> the, the, plus the fact that, you know, the preparation for the, actually the preparation for the course, learning all these skills that I was talking about earlier, uh, took even more time. I mean, like, you know, learning how to do video editing and learning how to make a website, you know, tipa bang. I would be at it from about, Eight in the morning up to about midnight every day, no. So it was really a lot of work. We just have to put in the work, because yeah, there's there's no way around it, eh? no. Sure, fine, you know, you have to do in your domestic things like I have to cook, no, I have to clean, no. Pag weekends, medyo, I still have to work, so but I have to clean, I have to, you know, I have to clean the house and all of this. I have to cook, you know. Pero you know, this is our job. We just have to keep doing it. Okay, thank you, Sir Robin. And that's based on uh, his uh, decades of experience teaching the arts. No? Uh, maybe I think no, just to somehow um, lighten a bit yung challenge, no? you can of course put in some parameters. No? Nabanggit ni Sir Robin na you can put a, a word count limit no? para medyo a little shorter yung babasahin mo. And then you can also make particular questions that are specific para hindi masyadong kalat-kalat yung mga answers na babasahin mo and it will take another set of processing and pondering each item. You know? So that has been my experience in my previous classes. Kaya it's something that I think it's very practical to share. Uh, how about you, Ma'am Sophie? <clears throat> like Sir Robin, um... Uh, I rely for assessment on short papers, short reflection papers. But um, ever since the pandemic, I've been using Ouble. Um It's been my platform. And what I do is um, we have weekly short 
um, reactions. Um, they have to write make these short reactions, and all the students can see each other's work. Mm. Yeah, so that they can interact with each other. They can say, "Na ah, like si ganyan ganyan." I have also like this, like that, and and then I re I reply, and sometimes I tell them, "Why this looks something like this other thing?" So I try to make it conversational and to make up for the distance. Yes. Yun lang. Everything's out there. Uh, for all I know, baka, ah, katulad nung sinabi, yun na yun. <laughs> um, pero I asked them for um, examples that they know about. So they always have to have some content in there, even if they agree with each other, because that's what happens when they can read each other's work. Mm -hmm. So that's my experience no, from the writing. But it's really writing and reading. Um, dependent the assessment. Okay, I would like to attest to that. No, yung discussion. I'm not sure if discussion boards po yung format niyo, Ma'am Sophie. No, but to make uh, the answers public. No, because uh, if we put our uh, ourselves on the shoes of our students, no, so they are uh, studying within their rooms or within their houses. No, and then interactions with their classmates, which is very evident previously in face to face. Um, has really diminished a lot, no? So, parang in a way, these discussion boards allow some form of interaction between these students. Para man lang magkakilakilala sila, they would know where another student is coming from. Probably, I am from the same province. OMG, malapit lang pala tayo nakatira, etc., etc. So, may mga moments rin uh, that somehow uh, try to... Um, try to address no yung lack of interaction dahil sa distance learning okay so thank you for your inputs um ito po it's quite um, a controversial topic no that uh, i think it's important to ask no to what extent are we going to be compassionate with our students in this time of the pandemic hmm. ano po yung inyong um, perspectives on this well, again, uh, it depends on the situation, no? Uh, that's why I try to find out as much as I can about the uh, environment and the atmosphere that the student is, uh, no, uh, is in, no? For example, right now, um, I have a student who is in Palawan, and uh, it turns out he doesn't have a laptop. He did not, because uh, here in UP, um, there's a survey that's given out before the start of the semester. And you're supposed to tell what kind of uh, device setup you have, whether you have a laptop or a cell phone or something like that. Okay. Um, apparently, he did not answer the survey. So I didn't know how, what his situation was. But, uh, at one point, I think uh, just before midterms, nag uh, SOS siya sa akin and said that sorry he cannot submit, he could not submit on time because uh, basically he doesn't have a laptop. He only has a cell phone. So I'm going like, and he doesn't have load. So I did some, I know, I did some sleuthing on him and I found out. Uh, a little more about him. I found out he was on the varsity team. So I called a friend of mine who was, uh, no, was dealing with, uh, who, who has uh, very close relations to the varsity and I asked him, can the varsity help this kid out? No, because apparently he doesn't have anything. No, he just has a smartphone. No, and he doesn't have load. So didn't he apply for some kind of assistance? You know, because there's, you know, UP gives out some assistance. So my friend looked into it and told the, the, the coach about it. I don't know what's happened <clears throat> since then. He has not replied to me, although I, I, we went back and forth for a while that evening, but he hasn't gotten back to me. Now, as according to the university, um, if that happens, because he has submitted some work, but he hasn't submitted all, and I have a feeling that he has a problem with load, no? Uh, the rule in UP right now is that uh, if this happens, 
then you can you either give the student an incomplete or you don't give a grade. No? And then they have one year to complete it. Now, that's as compassionate as I can be. No? So my, my, my version of compassion is that uh, all my deadlines are soft, but I, I warn them though this is the long if you know, if you delay or you fall behind, it's difficult to catch up. No? I mean you could catch up during uh, the mid year vacation, no? but it's difficult. No? But if you can't, then don't worry about it. You're not going to, you know, I, I, I will be compassionate. No? I'll just give you an incomplete or I'll give you another grade and you have a year to complete it. That's the best I can do. No? Otherwise, there are students, which happened last year. I had my students from Bicol, Talagang, they were in and out of the of evacuation centers. No? And yung tipo bang, uh, na, yung bang binaha yung computer nila, yung bung bahay nila was underwater, you know, so twice, you know. So I said, okay, don't worry about the deadlines. No? I'll, just give you, I'll just give you no grade and then you just complete, I'll, you have a year to complete it. No? Just email me and tell me when you're ready. So th this is what's been happening. No? Now, as far as uh, there are others who are having uh, mental issues, and we've been hearing a lot about this. No? Again, that's the same, my, that my, my, my practice is that just tell me. Just tell me if you're having problems. No? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wait until you resolve your problems. Some have mental problems. Some have family problems. I've even had some students with family problems. You people bang, well, never mind. <laughs> but uh, I said, don't worry, I'll wait. No? Just as long as you still have the course back with you, you still know what you're supposed to do. No? I'll wait. You have a year. No? Now, if you can resolve it within a year, fine, fantastic. No? So, don't worry about it. I've even had students who, who got COVID, who got sick. I had a student who, had, who was sick. Na, the entire family was sick. No? So, my version of compassion is to say, don't worry about your assignments. Your health comes before anything else. No? So, get well soon. And I hope your family gets well soon. No? I've had students, now they had family members who died. No? I remember I was giving a lecture, I was doing a lecture once, and then dumating yung text ng isa estudyante ko, I said, um, Sir, I'm sorry, I cannot attend today because my mother passed away. I'm going like, oh God. No? So I had to text her back and say, don't worry about it. Take as much time off as you want. Take a week off. Fix whatever it is. And then when you're ready to sit down and concentrate again, sige, let's talk. Just talk. Just, just email me or talk or call me, contact me, and let's see what we can do. No? That's, that's, that's as compassionate as I can be. I will reach out to them. I, will, I can even talk to them no? over the phone. No? And uh, I remember there was even one, uh, it was so bad that tipo bang, he, bang, he had no load. He couldn't submit. No? So I said, hey, it's only one student. So I sent him load. <laughs> I pass a load to him. Because if, if you don't want to be late, but you already have your paper, sige, I'll, I'll, I'll pay your load so that you can submit it on time. So we, we just have to do it in our own little small way. No, because sometimes institution, institutional assistance, you know, sometimes is very bureaucratic. Eh? No, so mahirap you have to file papers and stuff like that. Pero pag nandyan na yung emergency, ah, kailangan talagang, okay, what am I going to do with this student? How can I help him? You, know? you have to find some way of helping them. No? Okay, thank you, Sir Robin. So that's his version po of uh, compassion, no? How about you, Ma'am Sophie? Um, I was thinking about yung ano, yung sinasabing eight-second attention span. 
and blink, um, share, laugh, forget. That is not how I experience my students. Um, they are so anxious. Uh, um, if they were like that, they were forgetful or didn't care, just laughed and forgot things, no? They wouldn't be this anxious. And like Sir Robin, I spend a lot of time telling them, don't worry. No, just don't worry. Um, I, I'm thinking it's, um, well, they have a lot of challenges, more than young people should, no? And they still lack young perspective uh, that we have. Since we have survived more things, you can actually tell them that, you know, don't worry. Um, and yes, no, I have soft deadlines and I'm willing to wait. Para hang Jollibee, willing to wait. <laughs> no? um, I'm willing to wait. Um, also, um, regarding yung compassion, no, I think that yung UP administration naman has set, you know, set guidelines in place so that us teachers don't have to agonize over it so much. For one thing, we're not allowed to give fours and fives. No? So we can actually tell our students right away that nobody's going to fail. And that should be some kind of comfort. no? And then if they're really having a hard time, um, they can get an incomplete or a DRP and it's, it's fine. Um, they get so anxious, eh? So I really think that in Gen Z as being, it's not that way. That's not my experience of my current students. Okay, thank you, Ma'am Sophie. I think this particular notion of um, placing ourselves onto the shoes of the, our students is a very important uh, point that res have been resonating no, since we started with this open forum. And I think it's a good way to also close uh, this open forum, given that we've already um, had uh, an hour <laughs> discussing among ourselves these questions that were shared by uh, our participants. No? So going back to that point, no, we always have to, as uh, arts um, teachers, no, uh, we always have to look into yung, uh, yung position, positionality or context of uh, our students, not only in terms of how we employ uh, compassion to how we deal with them administratively, but also uh, in a more conceptual way. Now, so we look into what are the artistic or aesthetic experiences and objects that are um, within their proximity to make um, this discussion of uh, the arts all the more relevant and closer to them. Okay, we also have to, um, we also suggest, you know, highly suggest that we demystify this particular notion of high arts, okay, and look into yung mga nabanggit na other heuristic categories that were mentioned by Sir Robin, such as traditional arts and uh, the popular arts and culture, okay, so in that way, uh, we get to uh, allow them to actually visualize or conceptualize that the thing, the things or experiences that they are actually experiencing in their everyday around them okay, um, are actually uh, points that they can talk about or study as some forms of artworks or art experiences. Okay, so I think that is a good way uh, of ending this particular session. Okay, so we thank um, um, our speakers, our esteemed speakers from the Department of Art Studies, Dr. Robin Rivera, and uh, our chair, uh, Professor Guillermo, uh, Professor Sofia Guillermo, and most especially you know, our participants who are very actively uh, participating in uh, the chat box and I think the comment section in the YouTube and Facebook page of GEC. No? But before we end uh, this particular session, no, we would like to call in um, the director of the General Education Center of the University of the Philippines in Diliman, Dr. Nancy Kimel Gabriel, or we fondly call her Mam um, Mam Nak, no, uh, to award the certificate of uh, appreciation or gratitude to our esteemed speakers.
Maraming maraming salamat po sa ating mga tagapagsalita at moderator ngayong umaga. Napakadami ko rin take away. So punta po tayo sa bahagi ng pagbibigay ng certific- certifico sa ating mga tagapagsalita. The General Education Center, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, UP Diliman and Commission on Higher Education award this Certificate of Appreciation to Professor Robin Daniel Z. Rivera for sharing his expertise as resource speaker in the Teach Talk, How to Teach and Manage Your Gen Z Class, Critical Approaches in the Arts Edition. Under Linangan, the GE Faculty Development Extension Program held on the 13th day of December 2021 via Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook. Signed by yours truly as the GEC Director and Dr. Teresa T. Payungayong, the our Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. So, thank you. Natin ng picture si Sir Robin. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Smile. Okay. Ngayon naman po ay yung kay Assistant Professor Sofia. Highlight natin si Ma'am Sophie. Okay. The GEC, the OVCAA, UP Diliman, and Commission on Higher Education award this Certificate of Appre- Appreciation to Assistant Professor Sofia Guillermo for sharing his expertise as resource speaker in the Teach Talk, How to Teach and Manage Your Gen Z Class under Linangan, the GE Faculty Development Extension Program held on the 13th day of September, December via via Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook, signed by your, yours truly and Dr. Teresa T. Payungay. Thank you, uh, Mom Sophie. Maraming Sma- salamat, Mom Nat. Kunin ka namin ang picture sa katabi ng iyong certificate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Maraming salamat. Hindi po. So tuloy-tuloy na. Ngayon ay nasa huling bahagi na tayo ng... Uh, um, Sir Mark. Ay, okay. Ay, sorry, sorry. Sir Mark. Ngayon naman po ay ibibigay ang sertipiko para sa napakagaling na moderator natin. The GEC, the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, UP Diliman, and Commission on Higher Education. Award the Certificate of Appreciation to Mark Louis Luge as moderator in the Teach Talk, How to Teach and Manage Your Gen Z Class, Critical Approaches in the Arts Edition under Linangan, the GE the Faculty Development Extension Program held on the 13th day of December via Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook. Signed by yours truly and Dr. Maria Teresa T. Payungayo. Thank you very much, Sir Mark. Thank Ang lahat sa opportunity. Po, ayan, sige. Uh, kuhanan ka namin si... Smile. Thank you very much. Ang mga tagapagsalita po natin at ang moderator ng webinar na ito ay nanggagaling po sa Department of Art Studies ng UP Diliman. So to formally close the program, uh, maraming unang siyempre, pasasalamat. Kay Prof. Robin, Assistant Prof. Sophia, and uh, Mr. Mark Louis Luge para sa napakahusay, napakamakabuluhan, napakagaling na session natin sa webinar na ito, Critical Approaches in the Arts. Uh, napakasaya ko po personally, ang dami kong take away, no? dami kong napulot para sa araw na ito. Hindi lang sa pamamaraan ng pagtuturo, ano? kundi sa nilalaman mismo na intindihan ko yung tinatawag na critical approach in the arts no uh, big words sa akin yung paulit-ulit kong naririnig ngayong umaga na contextual and critical no na hindi lang lampas na tayo dun sa 
na pagdadala ng klase na tinatawag na up art appreciation pero kailangan na na naiintindihan uh, mas nagiging analytical ang mga estudyante natin and even us professors sa pag-aaral ng sining no yung sining na intindihan ko na it's in us no yung art mismo it's in us nasa pagdamdam natin ng mga bagay-bagay no nandoon ang sining so yung pagtingin natin ng mga structure o ng kaayusan kahit walang kaayusan kahit sa magulong kaayusan pala may sining may ritmo din ano may pattern and sometimes wala ring pattern no at yung palaging sinasabi kanina no na yung una mas very strong yung first line is a robin na art does not exist in a vacuum no at uh, may unity din ito dun sa sinasabi ni assistant prof Sophie na it is always grounded in society history and culture no palaging yung yung sining o yung mga dika ay laging representatibo ng isang context o ng isang panahon ng isang um, uh, konteksto ng isang kultura. No, kaya sa sining na, nasasalamin lahat ng ating um, kalagayan, yung konkretong kalagayan ng tao. At uh, uh, kailang sagutin bakit yung mga bakit at paano, bakit kaya ganyan yan. No, so maaring masalamin ng isang dika ang mga issues and problems ng particular group of people, ng individual o ng society, no? at uh, yung kanilang saloobin, yung kanilang aspirasyon, yung inaadhika, even yung mga pagpupunyagi at pakikibaka, naka-express lahat, may sining iyan. Kaya yung sining, napakalaki ng potential niya, na baguhin yung tao at yung tao ang babago dun sa mundo. Siguro yun yung critical aspect doon, di ba? Yung hindi lang tayo nag appreciate ng art. no Pero yung art, may function din siya na uh, binabago niya ang uri ng lipunan na kinapapaloob lang natin. Kaya may potential din siya at may tungkulin pa nga na maging liberating at mapagpalaya especially kung may hindi magandang nangyayari sa society especially kapag may oppression at may um, exploitation ayan at um, marami din po akong bagong napulot sa in terms of uh, paraan ng pagtuturo no yung always historicize ni Prof. Sophie, which I always do because ako din, ako ay nanggagaling sa disiplina din ng kasaysayan. Ano? Nag-agree ako doon. Kasi ang daling magpaliwanag, di ba, kapag ka naintindihan ng mga estudyante, bakit at paano at an anong posibleng dahilan, bakit nalika ang particular art na iyan. And then yung Napulot ko yung bago, yung two-minute video introduction ni, Sel, ni Sir Robin. No? At maari kong sigurong gayahin at uh, uh, gawin yan sa aking klase. At uh, pati yung napaka-detalyado, no? yung haba, yung haba ng, ano, ng reflex, reflection ng 250 words. <laughs> Naisip ko baka ito yung solution sa problema ko na dapat merong ano merong may limitation na isiset. And I agree na pakahirap ng uh, checking. No, at wala naman tayong choice, hindi naman tayo pwedeng magbigay ng multiple <laughs> ano yon, multiple choice na uh, hindi natin masyadong makakapa kung ano yung nagiging pag-unlad ng estudyante natin sa ganong paraan. So, kailangan talagang makita kung paano sila nag-iisip. And then, yung particular consciousness sa timetable. So, marami pong salamat sa ating mga tagapagsalita. I'm sure, makikita nyo naman ang chat box natin. 
napakahusay ng feedback nila sa inyo. At uh, equally mahusay ang reflections ng mga faculty na nagpa-participate. Sana ang bawat participants mabasa niyo po ang feedback ng mga kapwa natin guro na nanggagaling sa iba't ibang universidad at uh, kolehiyo nationwide mula sa north to south. Thank you very much po. Thank you very much, Mark, para sa mahusay na facilitation ng ating session for today. Mauulit ka sa amin. <laughs> At uh, thank you very much, Sir Robin, ang nag-recommend sa'yo. <laughs> At tama siya. Nag-agree ako. Marami pong salamat. Maraming salamat sa GEC staff, kay SAR, uh, Kendrick, uh, Jerusalem, Say, and Jerome para sa pag-oorganisa ng webinar natin. Ang uh, Linangan Faculty Development Extension Program ay buwan-buwan po natin sinasagawa mula noong September hanggang July 2022. Ang susunod po nating session ay sa February 18 para pag-usapan naman yung subject na etika o ethics one. So magkita-kita po tayong lahat sa February 18. Thank you very much. Picture po tayo pa. Salamat po. Salamat po, Ma'am Nak. Picture po tayo, sir. Okay. Open your camera po. Picture po tayo. Sige. Hello. Okay na. Maraming salamat. Hey, thank, thank you. So thank you, sir. Have a nice day. Uh, your lunch. Yeah. Ingat palagi. <laughs>